The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter Godwin Woodson First published by the Associated Publishers, 1933 Forward The thoughts brought together in this volume have been expressed in recent addresses and articles written by the author. From time to time, persons deeply interested in the point of view therein presented have requested that these comments on education be made available in book form. To supply this demand, this volume is given to the public. In the preparation of the volume, the author has not followed in detail the productions upon which most of the book is based. The aim is to set forth only the thought developed in passing from the one to the other. The language in some cases then is entirely new and the work is not a collection of essays. In this way repetition has been avoided except to emphasize the thesis which the author sustains. Carter Godwin Woodson, Washington DC, January 1933 Preface Herein are recorded not opinions but the reflections of one who for 40 years has participated in the education of the black, brown, yellow, and white races in both hemispheres and in tropical and temperate regions. Such experience too has been with students in all grades from the kindergarten to the university. The author moreover has traveled around the world to observe not only modern school systems in various countries but to study the special systems set up by private agencies and governments to educate the natives in their colonies and dependencies. Some of these observations too have been checked against more recent studies on a later tour. Discussing herein the mistakes made in the education of the Negro, the writer frankly admits that he has committed some of these errors himself. In several chapters moreover, he specifically points out wherein he himself has strayed from the path of wisdom. This book then is not intended as a broadside against any particular person or class, but it is given as a corrective for methods which have not produced satisfactory results. The author does not support the once popular view that in matters of education, Negroes are rightfully subjected to the will of others on the presumption that these poor people are not large taxpayers and must be content with charitable contributions to their uplift. The author takes the position that the consumer pays the tax and as such every individual of the social order should be given unlimited opportunity to make the most of himself. Such opportunity too should not be determined from without by forces set to direct the prescribed element in a way to redound solely to the good of others, but should be determined by the makeup of the Negro himself and by what his environment requires of him. This new program of uplift, the author contends, should not be decided upon by the trial and error method in the application of devices used in dealing with others in a different situation and at another epoch. Only by careful study of the Negro himself and the life which he is forced to lead can we arrive at the proper procedure in this crisis. The mere imparting of information is not education. Above all things, the effort must result in making a man think and do for himself just as the Jews have done in spite of universal persecution. In thus estimating the results obtained from the so-called education of the Negro, the author does not go to the census figures to show the progress of the race. It may be of no importance to the race to be able to boast today of many times as many quote educated members as it had in 1865. If they are of the wrong kind the increase in numbers will be a disadvantage rather than an advantage. The only question which concerns us here is whether these quote educated persons are actually equipped to face the ordeal before them or unconsciously contribute to their own undoing by perpetuating the regime of the oppressor. Herein however lies no argument for the oft heard contention that education for the white man should mean one thing and for the Negro a different thing. The element of race does not enter here. It is merely a matter of exercising common sense 
in approaching people through their environment in order to deal with conditions as they are rather than as you would like to see them or imagine that they are. There may be a difference in method of attack, but the principle remains the same. Quote unquote, highly educated Negroes denounce persons who advocate for the Negro a sort of education different in some respects from that now given the white man. Negroes who have been so long inconvenienced and denied opportunities for development are naturally afraid of anything that sounds like discrimination. They are anxious to have everything the white man has even if it is harmful. The possibility of originality in the Negro therefore is discounted 100% to maintain a nominal equality. If the whites decide to take up Mormonism the Negroes must follow their lead. If the whites neglect such a study, then the Negroes must do likewise. The author, however, does not have such an attitude. He considers the educational system as it has developed both in Europe and America an antiquated process which does not hit the mark even in the case of the needs of the white man himself. If the white man wants to hold on to it, let him do so. But the Negro so far as he is able should develop and carry out a program of his own. The so-called modern education with all its defects however does others so much more good than it does the Negro because it has been worked out in conformity to the needs of those who have enslaved and oppressed weaker peoples. For example the philosophy and ethics resulting from our educational system have justified slavery, peonage, segregation and lynching. The oppressor has the right to exploit, to handicap, and to kill the oppressed. Negroes daily educated in the tenets of such a religion of the strong have accepted the status of the weak as divinely ordained, and during the last three generations of their nominal freedom they have done practically nothing to change it. Their pouting and resolutions indulged in by a few of the race have been of little avail. No systematic effort toward change has been possible for, taught the same economics, history, philosophy, literature, and religion which have established the present code of morals. The Negro's mind has been brought under the control of his oppressor. The problem of holding the Negro down, therefore, is easily solved. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his quote unquote proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. The same educational process which inspires and stimulates the oppressor with the thought that he is everything and has accomplished everything worthwhile depresses and crushes at the same time the spark of genius in the Negro by making him feel that his race does not amount to much and never will measure up to the standards of other peoples. The Negro thus educated is a hopeless liability of the race. The difficulty is that the quote-unquote educated Negro is compelled to live and move among his own people whom he has been taught to despise. As a rule therefore the educated Negro prefers to buy his food from a white grocer because he has been taught that the Negro is not clean. It does not matter how often a Negro washes his hands then he cannot clean them and it does not matter how often a white man uses his hands he cannot soil them. The educated Negro, moreover, is disinclined to take part in Negro business because he has been taught in economics that Negroes cannot operate in this particular sphere. The educated Negro gets less and less pleasure out of the Negro church, not on account of its primitiveness and increasing corruption, but because of his preference for the seats of righteousness controlled by his oppressor. This has been his education and nothing else can be expected of him. If the educated Negro could go off and be white he might be happy 
but only a mulatto now and then can do this. The large majority of this class then must go through life denouncing white people because they are trying to run away from the blacks and decrying the blacks because they are not white. The Miseducation of the Negro Chapter 1 The Seat of the Trouble The quote-unquote educated Negroes have the attitude of contempt toward their own people because in their own as well as in their mixed schools Negroes are taught to admire the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, and the Teuton, and to despise the African. Of the hundreds of Negro high schools recently examined by an expert in the United States Bureau of Education, only 18 offer a course taking up the history of the Negro, and in most of the Negro colleges and universities where the Negro is thought of, the race is studied only as a problem, or dismissed as of little consequence. For example, an officer of a Negro university, thinking that an additional course on the Negro should be given there, called upon a Negro doctor of philosophy of the faculty to offer such work. He promptly informed the officer that he knew nothing about the Negro. He did not go to school to waste his time that way. He went to be educated in a system which dismisses the Negro as a non-entity. At a Negro summer school two years ago, a white instructor gave a course on the Negro, using for his text a work which teaches that whites are superior to the blacks. When asked by one of the students why he used such a textbook, the instructor replied that he wanted them to get that point of view. Even schools for Negroes, then, are places where they must be convinced of their inferiority. The thought of the inferiority of the Negro is drilled into him in almost every class he enters and in almost every book he studies. If he happens to leave school after he masters the fundamentals before he finishes high school or reaches college, he will naturally escape some of this bias and may recover in time to be of service to his people. Practically all of the successful Negroes in this country are of the uneducated type or of that of Negroes who have had no formal education at all. The large majority of the Negroes who have put on the finishing touches of our best colleges are all but worthless in the development of their people. If after leaving school they have the opportunity to give out to Negroes what traducers of the race would like to have it learn, such persons may thereby earn a living at teaching or preaching what they have been taught but they never become a constructive force in the development of the race. The so-called school, then, becomes a questionable factor in the life of this despised people. As another has well said, to handicap a student by teaching him that his black face is a curse and that his struggle to change his condition is hopeless is the worst sort of lynching. It kills one's aspirations and dooms him to vagabondage and crime. It is strange, then, that the friends of truth and the promoters of freedom have not risen up against the present propaganda in the schools and crushed it. This crusade is much more important than the anti-lynching movement, because there would be no lynching if it did not start in the schoolroom. Why not exploit, enslave, or exterminate a class that everybody is taught to regard as inferior. To be more explicit, we may go to the seed of the trouble. Our most widely known scholars have been trained in universities outside of the South. Northern and Western institutions, however, have had no time to deal with matters which concern the Negro especially. They must direct their attention to the problems of the majority of their constituents and too often they have stimulated their prejudices by referring to the Negro as unworthy of consideration. Most of what these universities have offered as language, mathematics, and science may have served a good purpose, but much of what they have taught as economics, history, literature, religion, and philosophy is propaganda and can't that involved a waste of time 
and misdirected the Negroes thus trained. And even in the certitude of science or mathematics, it has been unfortunate that the approach to the Negro has been borrowed from a quote-unquote foreign method. For example, the teaching of arithmetic in the fifth grade in a backward county in Mississippi should mean one thing in the Negro school and a decidedly different thing in the white school. The Negro children, as a rule, come from the homes of tenants and peons who have to migrate annually from plantation to plantation looking for light which they have never seen. The children from the homes of white planters and merchants live permanently in the midst of calculations, family budgets, and the like, which enable them sometimes to learn more by contact than the Negro can acquire in school. Instead of teaching such Negro children less arithmetic, they should be taught much more of it than the white children, for the latter attend a graded school consolidated by free transportation when the Negroes go to one-room rented hovels to be taught without equipment and by incompetent teachers educated scarcely beyond the eighth grade. In schools of theology, Negroes are taught the interpretation of the Bible worked out by those who have justified segregation and winked at the economic debasement of the Negro sometimes almost to the point of starvation. Deriving their sense of right from this teaching, graduates of such schools can have no message to grip the people whom they have been ill-trained to serve. Most of such miseducated ministers therefore preach to benches, while illiterate Negro preachers do the best they can in supplying the spiritual needs of the masses. In the schools of business administration, Negroes are trained exclusively in the psychology and economics of Wall Street and are therefore made to despise the opportunities to run ice wagons push banana carts, and sell peanuts among their own people. Foreigners who have not studied economics, but have studied Negroes, take up this business and grow rich. In schools of journalism, Negroes are being taught how to edit such metropolitan dailies as the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times, which would hardly hire a Negro as a janitor. And when these graduates come to the Negro weeklies for employment, they are not prepared to function in such establishments, which, to be successful, must be built upon accurate knowledge of the psychology and philosophy of the Negro. When a Negro has finished his education in our schools, then he has been equipped to begin the life of an Americanized or Europeanized white man. But before he steps from the threshold of his alma mater, he is told by his teachers that he must go back to his own people from whom he has been estranged by a vision of ideals which in his disillusionment he will realize that he cannot attain. He goes forth to play his part in life, but he must be both social and bisocial at the same time. While he is a part of the body politic, he is in addition to this a member of a particular race to which he must restrict himself in all matters social. While serving his country, he must serve within a special group. While being a good American, he must, above all things, be a good Negro. And to perform this definite function, he must learn to stay in a quote-unquote Negro's place. For the arduous task of serving a race thus handicapped, however, the Negro graduate has had little or no training at all. The people whom he has been ordered to serve have been belittled by his teachers to the extent that he can hardly find delight in undertaking what his education has led him to think is impossible. Considering his race as blank in achievement, then he sets out to stimulate the imitation of others. The performance is kept up a while, but like any other effort at meaningless imitation, it results in failure. Facing this undesirable result, the highly educated Negro often grows sour. He becomes too pessimistic to be a constructive force and usually develops into a chronic fault finder or a complainant 
at the bar of public opinion. Often when he sees that the fault lies at the door of the white oppressor whom he is afraid to attack, he turns upon the pioneering Negro who is at work doing the best he can to extricate himself from an uncomfortable predicament. In this effort to imitate, however, these quote-unquote educated people are sincere. They hope to make the Negro conform quickly to the standard of the whites and thus remove the pretext for the barriers between the races. They do not realize, however, that even if the Negroes do successfully imitate the whites, nothing new has thereby been accomplished. You simply have a larger number of persons doing what others have been doing. The unusual gifts of the race have not thereby been developed, and an unwilling world therefore continues to wonder what the Negro is good for. These educated people, however, decry any such thing as race consciousness, and in some respects they are right. They do not like to hear such expressions as Negro literature, Negro poetry, African art, or thinking black. And, roughly speaking, we must concede that such things do not exist. These things did not figure in the courses which they pursued in school. And why should they? Aren't we all Americans? Then whatever is American is as much the heritage of the Negro as of any other group in this country. The highly educated contend, moreover, that when the Negro emphasizes these things, he invites racial discrimination by recognizing such differences of the races. The thought that the Negro is one thing and the white man another is the stock and trade argument of the Caucasian to justify segregation. Why then should the Negro blame the white man for doing what he himself does? These highly educated Negroes, however, fail to see that it is not the Negro who takes this position. The white man forces him to it, and to extricate himself therefrom, the Negro leader must so deal with the situation as to develop in the segregated group the power with which they can elevate themselves. The differentness of the races, moreover, is no evidence of superiority or of inferiority. This merely indicates that each race has certain gifts which the others do not possess. It is by the development of these gifts that every race must justify its right to exist. Chapter 2 How We Missed the Mark How we have arrived at the present state of affairs can be understood only by studying the forces effective in the development of Negro education since it was systematically undertaken immediately after emancipation. To point out merely the defects as they appear today will be of little benefit to the present and future generations. These things must be viewed in their historic setting. The conditions of today have been determined by what has taken place in the past, and in a careful study of this history we may see more clearly the great theater of events in which the Negro has played a part. We may understand better what his role has been and how well he has functioned in it. The idea of educating the Negroes after the Civil War was largely a prompting of philanthropy. Their white neighbors failed to assume this responsibility. These black people had been liberated as a result of a sectional conflict out of which their former owners had emerged as victims. From this class, then, the freedmen could not expect much sympathy or cooperation in the effort to prepare themselves to figure as citizens of a modern republic. From functionaries of the United States government itself and from those who participated in the conquest of the secessionist, early came the plan of teaching these freedmen the simple duties of life as worked out by the Freedmen's Bureau and philanthropic agencies. When baptized, this effort became a program for the organization of churches and schools and the direction of them along lines which had been considered 
most conducive to the progress of people otherwise circumstanced. Here and there some variation was made in this program in view of the fact that the status of the freedmen in no way paralleled that of their friends and teachers, but such thought was not general. When the Negroes in some way would learn to perform the duties which other elements of the population had prepared themselves to discharge, they would be duly qualified. It was believed to function as citizens of the country. Inasmuch as most Negroes lived in the agricultural South, moreover, and only a few of them at first acquired small farms, there was little in their life which any one of thought could not have easily understood. The poverty which afflicted them for a generation after emancipation held them down to the lowest order of society, nominally free, but economically enslaved. The participation of the freedmen in government for a few years during the period known as the Reconstruction had little bearing on their situation except that they did join with the uneducated poor whites in bringing about certain much desired social reforms, especially in giving the South its first plan of democratic education and providing for a school system at public expense. Neither this inadequately supported school system, nor the struggling higher institutions of a classical order established about the same time, however, connected the Negroes very closely with life as it was. These institutions were concerned rather with life as they hoped to make it. When the Negro found himself deprived of influence in politics, therefore, and at the same time unprepared to participate in the higher functions in the industrial development which this country began to undergo, it soon became evident to him that he was losing ground in the basic things of life. He was spending his time studying about things which had been or might be, but he was learning little to help him to do better the task at hand. Since the Negroes believed that the causes of this untoward condition lay without the race, migration was attempted, and emigration to Africa was again urged. At this psychological moment came the wave of industrial education which swept the country by storm. The educational authorities in the cities and states throughout the Black Belt began to change the course of study to make the training of the Negro conform to this policy. The missionary teachers from the North in defense of their idea of more liberal training however fearlessly attacked this new educational policy and the Negroes participating in the same dispute arrayed themselves respectively on one side or the other. For a generation thereafter the quarrel as to whether the Negro should be given a classical or a practical education was the dominant topic in Negro schools and churches throughout the United States. Labor was the most important thing of life, it was argued. Practical education counted in reaching that end, and the Negro worker must be taught to solve this problem of efficiency before directing attention to other things. Others, more narrow-minded, than the advocates of industrial education seized upon the idea feeling that although the Negro must have some semblance of education it would be a fine stroke to be able to make a distinction between the training given the Negro and that provided for the whites. Inasmuch as the industrial educational idea rapidly gained ground too many Negroes for political purposes began to espouse it and schools and colleges, hoping thereby to obtain money, worked out accordingly makeshift provisions for such instruction, although they could not satisfactorily offer it. A few real industrial schools actually equipped themselves for this work and turned out a number of graduates with such preparation. Unfortunately, however, the affair developed into a sort of battle of words, for in spite of all they said and did, the majority of the Negroes, those who did not make some effort to obtain an education, 
did not actually receive either the industrial or the classical education. Negroes attended industrial schools, took such training as was prescribed, and received their diplomas. But few of them developed adequate efficiency to be able to do what they were supposedly trained to do. The schools in which they were educated could not provide for all the experience with machinery which white apprentices trained in factories had. Such industrial education as these Negroes received then was merely to master a technique already discarded in progressive centers and even in less complicated operations of industry these schools had no such facilities as to parallel the numerous processes of factories conducted on the plan of the division of labor. Except what value such training might have in the development of the mind by making practical applications of mathematics and science, then it was a failure. The majority of Negro graduates of industrial schools, therefore, have gone into other avenues, and too often into those for which they have had no preparation whatever. Some few who actually prepared for the industrial sphere by self-improvement likewise sought other occupations for the reason that Negroes were generally barred from higher pursuits by trade unions. And being unable to develop captains of industry to increase the demand for persons in these lines, the Negroes have not opened up many such opportunities for themselves. During these years, too, the schools for the classical education for Negroes have not done any better. They have proceeded on the basis that every ambitious person needs a liberal education when, as a matter of fact, this does not necessarily follow. The Negro trained in the advanced phases of literature, philosophy, and politics has been unable to develop far in using his knowledge because of having to function in the lower spheres of the social order. Advanced knowledge of science, mathematics, and languages, moreover, has not been much more useful except for mental discipline because of the dearth of opportunity to apply such knowledge among people who are largely common laborers in towns or peons on the plantations. The extent to which such higher education has been successful in leading the Negro to think, which above all is the chief purpose of education, has merely made him more of a malcontent when he can sense the drift of things and appreciate the impossibility of success envisioning conditions as they really are. It is very clear, therefore, that we do not have in the life of the Negro today a large number of persons who have been benefited by either of the systems about which we have quarreled so long. The number of Negro mechanics and artisans have comparatively declined during the last two generations. The Negroes do not proportionately represent as many skilled laborers as they did before the Civil War. If the practical education which the Negroes received helped to improve the situation so that it is today no worse than what it is, certainly it did not solve the problem as was expected of it. On the other hand, in spite of much classical education of the Negroes, we do not find in the race a large supply of thinkers and philosophers. One excuse is that scholarship among Negroes has been vitiated by the necessity for all of them to combat segregation and fight to retain standing ground in the struggle of the races. Comparatively few American Negroes have produced credible literature and still fewer have made any large contribution to philosophy or science. They have not risen to the heights of black men farther removed from the influences of slavery and segregation. For this reason, we do not find among American Negroes a Pushkin, a Gomez, a Jeffrey, a Captain, or a Dumas. Even men like Roland Hayes and Henry O. Tanner 
have risen to the higher levels by getting out of this country to relieve themselves of our stifling traditions and to recover from their education. Chapter 3 How We Drifted Away from the Truth How then did the education of the Negro take such a trend? The people who maintained schools for the education of certain Negroes before the Civil War were certainly sincere and so were the missionary workers who went south to enlighten the freedmen after the results of that conflict had given the Negroes a new status. These earnest workers, however, had more enthusiasm than knowledge. They did not understand the task before them. This undertaking, too, was more of an effort toward social uplift than actual education. Their aim was to transform the Negroes, not to develop them. The freedmen who were to be enlightened were given little thought, for the best friends of the race, ill-taught themselves, followed the traditional curricula of the times which did not take the Negro into consideration except to condemn or pity him. In geography the races were described in conformity with the program of the usual propaganda to engender in whites a race hate of the Negro and in the Negroes contempt for themselves. A poet of distinction was selected to illustrate the physical features of the white race. A bedecked chief of a tribe those of the red, a proud warrior the brown, a prince the yellow, and a savage with a ring in his nose the black. The Negro of course stood at the foot of the social ladder. The description of the various parts of the world was worked out according to the same plan. The parts inhabited by the Caucasian were treated in detail. Less attention was given to the yellow people, still less to the red, very little to the brown, and practically none to the black race. Those people who are far removed from the physical characteristics of the Caucasians or who do not materially assist them in domination or exploitation of others were not mentioned except to be belittled or decried. From the teaching of science the Negro was likewise eliminated. The beginnings of science in various parts of the Orient were mentioned but the Africans early advancement in this field was omitted. Students were not told that ancient Africans of the interior knew sufficient science to concoct poisons for arrowheads, to mix durable colors for paintings, to extract metals from nature and refine them for development in the industrial arts. Very little was said about the chemistry in the method of Egyptian embalming, which was the product of the mixed breeds of northern Africa, now known in the modern world as quote unquote colored people. In the study of language in school pupils were made to scoff at the Negro dialect as some peculiar possession of the Negro which they should despise rather than directed to study the background of this language as a broken down African tongue. In short to understand their own linguistic history which is certainly more important for them than the study of French phonetics or historical Spanish grammar. To the African language as such no attention was given except in case of the preparation of traders, missionaries and public functionaries to exploit the natives. This number of persons thus trained of course constituted a small fraction hardly deserving attention. From literature, the African was excluded altogether. He was not supposed to have expressed any thought worth knowing. The philosophy in the African proverbs and in the rich folklore of that continent was ignored to give preference to that developed on the distant shores of the Mediterranean. Most missionary teachers of the freedmen, like most men of our time, had never read the interesting books of travel in Africa. 
and have never heard of the Tariq S. Sudan. In the teaching of fine arts, these instructors usually started with Greece by showing how that art was influenced from without, but they omitted the African influence, which scientists now regard as significant and dominant in early Hellas. They failed to teach the student the Mediterranean melting pot, with the Negroes from Africa bringing their wares, their ideas, and their blood therein to influence the history of Greece, Carthage, and Rome, making desire father to the thought. Our teachers either ignored these influences or endeavored to belittle them by working out theories to the contrary. The bias did not stop at this point, for it invaded the teaching of the professions. Negro law students were told that they belonged to the most criminal element in the country, and an effort was made to justify the procedure in the seats of injustice where law was interpreted as being one thing for the white man and a different thing for the Negro. In constitutional law, the spinelessness of the United States Supreme Court in permitting the judicial nullification of the 14th and 15th Amendments was and still is boldly upheld in our few law schools. In medical schools, Negroes were likewise convinced of their inferiority in being reminded of their role as germ carriers. The prevalence of syphilis and tuberculosis among Negroes was especially emphasized without showing that these maladies are more deadly among the Negroes for the reason that they are Caucasian diseases. And since these plagues are new to the Negroes, these sufferers have not had time to develop against them the immunity which time has permitted in the Caucasian. Other diseases to which Negroes easily fall prey were mentioned to point out the race as an undesirable element when this condition was due to the Negroes economic and social status. Little emphasis was placed upon the immunity of the Negro from diseases like yellow fever and influenza which are so disastrous to whites. Yet the whites were not considered inferior because of this differential resistance to these plagues. In history of course the Negro had no place in this curriculum. He was pictured as a human being of the lower order, unable to subject passion to reason, and therefore useful only when made the hewer of wood and the drawer of water for others. No thought was given to the history of Africa except so far as it had been a field of exploitation for the Caucasian. You might study the history as it was offered in our system from the elementary school throughout the university and you would never hear Africa mentioned except in the negative. You would never thereby learn that Africans first domesticated the sheep, goat, and cow, developed the idea of trial by jury, produced the first string instruments, and gave the world its greatest boon in the discovery of iron. You would never know that prior to the Mohammedan invasion about 1000 AD, these natives in the heart of Africa had developed powerful kingdoms which were later organized as the Songhe Empire on the order of that of the Romans and boasting of similar grandeur. Unlike other people then, the Negro, according to this point of view, was an exception to the natural plan of things, and he had no such mission as that of an outstanding contribution to culture. The status of the Negro then was justly fixed as that of an inferior. Teachers of Negroes in their first schools after emancipation did not proclaim any such doctrine but the content of their curricula justified these inferences. An observer from outside of the situation naturally inquires why the Negroes, many of whom serve their race as teachers, 
have not changed this program. These teachers, however, are powerless. Negroes have no control over their education and have little voice in their other affairs pertaining thereto. In a few cases, Negroes have been chosen as members of public boards of education and some have been appointed members of private boards. But these Negroes are always such a small minority that they do not figure in the final working out of the educational program. The education of the Negroes then, the most important thing in the uplift of the Negroes, is almost entirely in the hands of those who have enslaved them and now segregate them. With quote-unquote miseducated Negroes in control themselves, however, it is doubtful that the system would be very much different from what it is or that it would rapidly undergo change. The Negroes thus placed in charge would be the products of the same system and would show no more conception of the task at hand than do the whites who have educated them and shaped their minds as they would have them function. Negro educators of today may have more sympathy and interest in the race than the whites now exploiting Negro institutions as educators, but the former have no more vision than their competitors. Taught from books of the same bias, trained by Caucasians of the same prejudices, or by Negroes of enslaved minds, one generation of Negro teachers after another have served for no higher purpose than to do what they are told to do. In other words, a Negro teacher instructing Negro children is in many respects a white teacher thus engaged, for the program in each case is about the same. There can be no reasonable objection to the Negroes doing what the white man tells him to do, if the white man tells him to do what is right, but right is purely relative. The present system under the control of the whites trains the Negro to be white and at the same time convinces him of the impropriety or the impossibility of his becoming white. It compels the Negro to become a good Negro for the performance of which his education is ill-suited. For the white man's exploitation of the Negro through economic restriction and segregation, the present system is sound and will doubtless continue until this gives place to the saner policy of actual interracial cooperation, not the present farce of racial manipulation in which the Negro is a figurehead. History does not furnish a case of the elevation of a people by ignoring the thought and aspiration of people thus served. This is slightly dangerous ground here. However, for the Negro's mind has been all but perfectly enslaved and that he has been trained to think what is desired of him. The highly educated Negroes do not like to hear anything uttered against this procedure because they make their living in this way and they feel that they must defend the system. Few miseducated Negroes ever act otherwise and if they so express themselves they are easily crushed by the large majority to the contrary so that the procession may move on without interruption. The result then is that the Negroes thus miseducated are of no service to themselves and none to the white man. The white man does not need the Negroes professional commercial or industrial assistance and as a result of the multiplication of mechanical appliances he no longer needs them in drudgery or menial service. The quote-unquote highly educated Negroes Moreover, do not need the Negro professional or commercial classes because Negroes have been taught that whites can serve them more efficiently in these spheres. Reduced then to teaching and preaching, the Negroes will have no outlet but to go down a blind alley. If the sort of education which they are now receiving 
is to enable them to find the way out of their present difficulties. Chapter 4 Education Under Outside Control in the new program of educating the Negro, what will become of the white teachers of the race? Someone recently inquired. This is a simple question requiring only a brief answer. The remaining few Christian workers who went south not so long after the Civil War and established schools and churches to lay the foundation on which we should now be building more wisely than we do, we would honor as a martyred throng. Anathema be upon him who would utter a word derogatory to the record of these heroes and heroines. We would pay high tribute also to unselfish southerners like Haygood, Curry, Ruffner, Northern, and Vance, and to white men of our time who believe that the only way to elevate people is to help them help themselves. The unfortunate successors of the northern missionary teachers of Negroes, however, have thoroughly demonstrated that they have no useful function in the life of the Negro. They have not the spirit of their predecessors and do not measure up to the requirements of educators desired in accredited colleges. If Negro institutions are to be as efficient as those for the whites in the South, the same high standard for the educators to direct them should be maintained. Negro schools cannot go forward with such a load of inefficiency and especially when the white presidents of these institutions are often less scholarly than Negroes who have to serve under them. By law and custom the white presidents and teachers of Negro schools are prevented from participating freely in the life of the Negro. They occupy, therefore, a most uncomfortable dual position. When the author once taught in a school with a mixed faculty, the white women connected with the institution would bow to him in patronizing fashion when on the campus, but elsewhere they did not see him. A white president of one Negro school never entertains a Negro in his home, preferring to shift such guests to the student's dining room. Another white president of a Negro college maintains on the campus a guest cottage, which Negroes can enter only as servants. Still another such functionary does not allow students to enter his home through the front door. Negroes trained under such conditions without protest become downright cowards, and in life will continue as slaves in spite of their nominal emancipation. What different method of approach or what sort of appeal would one make to the Negro child that cannot be made just as well by a white teacher? Someone asked not long ago. To be frank, we must concede that there is no particular body of facts that Negro teachers can impart to children of their own race that may not be just as easily presented by persons of another race if they have the same attitude as Negro teachers, but in most cases tradition, race hate, segregation, and terrorism make such a thing impossible. The only thing to do in this case, then, is to deal with the situation as it is. Yet, we should not take the position that a qualified white person should not teach in a Negro school. For certain work which temporarily some whites may be able to do better than the Negroes, there can be no objection to such service. But if the Negro is to be forced to live in the ghetto, he can more easily develop out of it under his own leadership than under that which is superimposed. The Negro will never be able to show all of his originality as long as his efforts are directed from without by those who socially prescribe him. Such quote-unquote friends will unconsciously keep him in the ghetto. Herein, however, the emphasis is not upon the necessity for separate systems, but upon the need for common-sense schools and teachers who understand and continue in sympathy with those whom they instruct. 
Those who take the position to the contrary have the idea that education is merely a process of imparting information. One who can give out these things or devise an easy plan for so doing then is an educator. In a sense this is true, but it accounts for most of the troubles of the Negro. Real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin with life as they find it and make it better. But the instruction so far given Negroes in colleges and universities has worked to the contrary. In most cases such graduates have merely increased the number of malcontents who offer no program for changing the undesirable conditions about which they complain. One should rely upon protest only when it is supported by a constructive program. Unfortunately, Negroes who think as the author does and dare express themselves are branded as opponents of interracial cooperation. As a matter of fact, however, such Negroes are the real workers in carrying out a program of interracial effort. Cooperation implies equality of the participants in the particular task at hand. On the contrary, however, the usual way now is for the whites to work out their plans behind closed doors, have them approved by a few Negroes serving nominally on a board, and then employ a white or mixed staff to carry out their program. This is not interracial cooperation. It is merely the ancient idea of calling upon the quote-unquote inferior to carry out the orders of the quote-unquote superior. To express it in post-classic language, as did Jesse O. Thomas, the Negroes do the cooing and the whites the operating. This unsound attitude of the friends of the Negro is due to the persistence of the medieval idea of controlling underprivileged classes. Behind closed doors, these quote-unquote friends say you need to be careful in advancing Negroes to commanding positions unless it can be determined beforehand that they will do what they are told to do. You can never tell when some Negroes will break out and embarrass their quote-unquote friends. After being advanced to positions of influence, some of them have been known to run amok and advocate social equality or demand for their race the privileges of democracy when they should restrict themselves to education and religious development. It is often said too that the time is not ripe for Negroes to take over the administration of their institutions for they do not have the contacts for raising money. But what becomes of this argument when we remember what Booker T. Washington did for Tuskegee and observe what R. R. Moton and John Hope are doing today? As the first Negro president of Howard University, Mordecai W. Johnson has raised more money for that institution among philanthropists than all of its former presidents combined. Furthermore, if after three generations the Negro colleges have not produced men qualified to administer their affairs, such an admission is an eloquent argument that they have failed ingloriously and should be immediately closed. Recently, someone asked me how I connect my criticism of the higher education of the Negroes with new developments in this sphere and especially with the four universities in the South which are to be made possible by the millions obtained from governments, boards, and philanthropists. I believe that the establishment of these four centers of learning at Washington, Atlanta, Nashville, and New Orleans can be so carried out as to mark an epoch in the development of the Negro race. On the other hand, there is just as much possibility for a colossal failure of the whole scheme. 
if these institutions are to be the replica of universities like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Chicago, if the men who are to administer them and teach in them are to be the products of roll-top desk theorists who have never touched the life of the Negro, the money thus invested will be just as profitably spent if it is used to buy peanuts to throw at the animals in a circus. Some of the thought behind the new educational movement is to provide in the South for educating the Negroes who are now crowding northern universities, especially the medical schools, many of which will not admit Negroes because of the racial friction in hospital practice. In the rush merely to make special provisions for these quote-unquote undesirable students, however, the institutions which are to train them may be established on false ideas and make the same blunders of the smaller institutions which have preceded them. It will hardly help a poisoned patient to give him a large dose of poison. In higher institutions for Negroes, organized along lines required for people differently circumstanced, some few may profit by being further grounded in the fundamentals. Others may become more adept in the exploitation of their people, and a smaller number may cross the divide and join the whites in useful service. But the large majority of the products of such institutions will increase rather than diminish the load which the masses have had to carry ever since their emancipation. Such ill-prepared workers will have no foundation upon which to build. The education of any people should begin with the people themselves, but Negroes thus trained have been dreaming about the ancients of Europe and about those who have tried to imitate them. In a course at Harvard, for example, students were required to find out whether Pericles was justly charged with trying to supplant the worship of Jupiter with that of Juno. Since that time, Negroes thus engaged have learned that they would have been much better prepared for work among the Negroes in the Black Belt if they had spent that time learning why John Jasper of quote-unquote Sun Do Move fame joined with Joshua in contending that the planet stood still in the middle of the line while he fought the battle the second time. Talking the other day with one of the men now giving the millions to build the four Negro universities in the South, however, I found that he is of the opinion that accredited institutions can be established in mushroom fashion with theorists out of touch with the people. In other words, you can go almost anywhere and build a three million dollar plant, place in charge a white man to do what you want accomplished, and in a short while he can secure or have trained to order the men necessary to make a university. We want here, he will say, a man who has his master's degree in English. Send me another who has his doctor's degree in sociology, and I can use one more in physics. Now, experience has shown that men of this type may fill in, but a university cannot be established with such raw recruits. The author once had some experience in trying to man a college in this fashion, and the result was a story that would make an interesting headline for the newspapers. When Dr. William Rainey Harper was establishing the University of Chicago, he called to the headship of the various departments only men who had distinguished themselves in the creative world. Some had advanced degrees and some had not. Several of them had never done any formal graduate work at all. All of them, however, were men whose thought was moving the world. It may be argued that the Negroes have no such men and must have them trained, but such a thing cannot be forced as we are now doing it. 
it would be better to stimulate the development of the more progressive teachers of old than experiment with novices produced by the degradation of higher education. The degradation of the doctorate especially dawned upon the author the other day more clearly than ever when a friend of his rushed into his office saying, quote, I have been trying to see you for several days. I have just failed to get a job for which I had been working and I am told that I cannot expect a promotion until I get my doctor's degree. End quote. That is what he called it. He could not even pronounce the words, but he is determined to have his quote unquote doctor's degree end quote to get the job in sight. This shameful status of higher education is due in large measure to low standards of institutions with a tendency toward the diploma mill procedure. To get a job or to hold one you go in and stay until they grind you out a quote unquote doctor's degree end quote and you do not have to worry any further. The assumption is that almost any school will be glad to have you thereafter and you will receive a large salary. Investigation has shown however that men who have the doctorate not only lose touch with the common people but they do not do as much creative work as those of less formal education. After having this honor conferred upon them these so-called scholars often rest on their oars. Few persons have thought of the seriousness of such inertia among men who are put in the lead of things because of meeting statutory requirements of frontier universities which are not on the frontier. The General Education Board and the Julius Rosenwald Fund have a policy which may be a partial solution of the undeveloped Negro college instructors problem. These foundations are giving Negro teachers scholarships to improve themselves for work in the sphere in which they are now laboring in the South. These boards as a rule do not send one to school to work for the doctor's degree. If they find a man of experience and good judgment showing possibilities for growth they will provide for him to study a year or more to refresh his mind with whatever there is new in his field. Experience has shown that teachers thus helped have later done much work better than doctors of philosophy made to order. The northern universities moreover cannot do graduate work for Negroes along certain lines when they are concentrating on the educational needs of people otherwise circumstanced. The graduate school for Negro studying chemistry is with George W. Carver at Tuskegee. At least a hundred youths should wait daily upon the words of this scientist to be able to pass on to the generations unborn his great knowledge of agricultural chemistry. Negroes desiring to specialize in agriculture should do it with workers like T. M. Campbell and B. F. Hubert among the Negro farmers of the South. In education itself the situation is the same. Neither Columbia nor Chicago can give an advanced course in Negro rural education for their work in education is based primarily upon what they know of the educational needs of the whites. Such work for Negroes must be done under the direction of the trailblazers who are building schoolhouses and reconstructing the educational program of those in the backwoods. Leaders of this type can supply the foundation upon which a university of realistic education may be established. We offer no argument here against earning advanced degrees, but these should come as honors conferred for training crowned with scholastic distinction not to enable a man to increase his salary or find a better paying position. 
The schools which are now directing attention exclusively to these external marks of learning will not contribute much to the uplift of the Negro. In Cleveland, not long ago, the author found at the Western Reserve University something unusually encouraging. A native of Mississippi, a white man trained in a northern university and now serving as a professor in one, has under him in sociology a Negro student from Georgia. For his dissertation, this Negro is collecting the sayings of his people in everyday life, their morning greetings, their remarks about the weather, their comments on things which happen around them, their reactions to things which strike them as unusual, and their efforts to interpret life as the panorama passes before them. This white Mississippian and black Georgian are on the right way to understand the Negro, and if they do not fall out about social equality, they will serve the Negro much better than those who are trying to find out whether Henry VIII lusted more after Anne Boleyn than after Catherine of Aragon, or whether Elizabeth was justly styled as more untruthful than Philip II of Spain. Chapter 5 The Failure to Learn to Make a Living the greatest indictment of such education as Negroes have received, however, is that they have thereby learned little as to making a living, the first essential in civilization. Rural Negroes have always known something about agriculture, and in a country where land is abundant, they have been able to make some sort of a living on the soil even though they have not always employed scientific methods of farming. In industry, where the competition is keener, however, what the Negro has learned in school has had little bearing on the situation as pointed out above. In business, the role of education as a factor in the uplift of the Negro has been still less significant. The Negroes of today are unable to employ one another, and the whites are inclined to call on Negroes only when workers of their own race have already been taken care of. For the solution of this problem, the miseducated Negro has offered no remedy whatever. What Negroes are now being taught does not bring their minds into harmony with life as they must face it. When a Negro student works his way through college by polishing shoes, he does not think of making a special study of the science underlying the production and distribution of leather and its products that he may someday figure in this sphere. The Negro boy sent to college by a mechanic seldom dreams of learning mechanical engineering to build upon the foundation his father has laid that in years to come he may figure as a contractor or a consulting engineer. The Negro girl who goes to college hardly wants to return to her mother if she is a washerwoman. But this girl should come back with sufficient knowledge of physics and chemistry and business administration to use her mother's work as a nucleus for a modern steam laundry. A white professor of a university recently resigned his position to become rich by running a laundry for Negroes in a southern city. A Negro college instructor would have considered such a suggestion an insult. The so-called education of Negro college graduates leads them to throw away opportunities which they have had and to go in quest of those which they do not find. In the case of the white youth in this country, they can choose their courses more at random and still succeed because of numerous opportunities offered by their people. But even they show so much more wisdom than do Negroes. For example, a year or two after the author left Harvard, he found out West, a schoolmate who was studying wool. How did you happen to go into this sort of thing? The author inquired. 
His people, the former replied, had some experience in war, and in college he prepared for this work. On the contrary, the author studied Aristotle, Plato, Marsiglio of Padua, and Pascasius Rathbertus when he was in college. His friend, who studied wool, however, is now independently rich and has sufficient leisure to enjoy the cultural side of life which his knowledge of the science underlying his business developed. But the author has to make his living by begging for a struggling cause. An observer recently saw at the market near his office a striking example of this inefficiency of our system. He often goes over there at noon to buy a bed of fruit and to talk with a young woman who successfully conducts a fruit stand there in cooperation with her mother. Some years ago he tried to teach her in high school, but her memory was poor and she could not understand what he was trying to do. She stayed a few weeks, smiling at the others who toiled, and finally left to assist her mother in business. She learned from her mother, however, how to make a living and be happy. This observer was reminded of this young woman soon thereafter when there came to visit him a friend who succeeded in mastering everything taught in high school at the time and later distinguished himself in college. This highly educated man brought with him a complaint against life. Having had extreme difficulty in finding an opportunity to do what he is trained to do, he has thought several times of committing suicide. A friend encouraged this despondent man to go ahead and do it. The sooner the better. The food and air which he is now consuming may then go to keep alive someone who is in touch with life and able to grapple with this problems. This man has been educated away from the fruit stand. This friend had been trying to convince this misfit of the unusual opportunities for the Negroes in business, but he reprimanded his advisor for urging him to take up such a task when most Negroes thus engaged have been failures. If we invest our money in some enterprise of our own, said he, those in charge will misuse or misappropriate it. I have learned from my study of economics that we had just as well keep on throwing it away. Upon investigation, however, it was discovered that this complainant and most others like him have never invested anything in any of the Negro enterprises, although they have tried to make a living by exploiting them. But they feel a bit guilty on this account, and when they have some apparent ground for fault finding, they try to satisfy their conscience, which all but condemns them for their suicidal course of getting all they can out of the race while giving nothing back to it. Gossiping and scandal-mongering Negroes, of course, come to their assistance. Miseducated by the oppressors of the race, such Negroes expect the Negro businessman to fail anyway. They seize, then, upon unfavorable reports, exaggerate the situation and circulate falsehoods throughout the world to their own undoing. You read such headlines as Greatest Negro Business Fails Negro Bank Robbed by Its Officers and The Twilight of Negro Business The miseducated Negroes then stand by saying I told you so Negroes cannot run business My professors pointed that out to me years ago when I studied economics in college, and I never intend to put any of my money in any Negro enterprise. Yet, investigation shows that in proportion to the amount of capital invested, Negro enterprises manifest about as much strength as businesses of others similarly situated. 
Negro businessmen have made mistakes, and they are still making them. But the weak link in the chain is that they are not properly supported and do not always grow strong enough to pass through a crisis. The Negro businessman then has not failed so much as he has failed to get support of Negroes who should be mentally developed sufficiently to see the wisdom of supporting such enterprises. Now the quote-unquote highly educated Negroes who have studied economics at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Chicago who say that the Negro cannot succeed in business because their professors who have never had a moment's experience in this sphere have written accordingly. The whites, they say, have the control of the natural resources and so monopolize the production of raw materials as to eliminate the competition of the Negro. Apparently this is true. All things being equal from the point of view of the oppressor, he sees that the Negro cannot meet the test. The impatient, highly educated Negroes, therefore, say that since under the present system of capitalism the Negro has no chance to toil upward in the economic sphere, the only hope for bettering his condition in this respect is through socialism, the overthrow of the present economic regime, and the inauguration of popular control of resources and agencies which are now being operated for personal gain. This thought is gaining ground among Negroes in this country and it is rapidly sweeping them into the ranks of what are commonly known as communists. There can be no objection to this radical change if it brings with it some unselfish genius to do the task better than it is now being done under the present regime of competition. Russia so far has failed to do well this particular thing under a proletarian dictatorship in an agricultural country. But whether this millennium comes or not, the capitalistic system is so strongly entrenched at present that the radicals must struggle many years to overthrow it, and if the Negro has to wait until that time to try to improve his condition, he will be starved out so soon that he will not be here to tell the story. The Negro, therefore, like all other oppressed people, must learn to do the so-called impossible. The uneducated Negro businessman, however, is actually at work doing the very thing which the miseducated Negro has been taught to believe cannot be done. This much handicapped Negro businessman could do better if he had some assistance, but our schools are turning out men who do as much to impede the progress of the Negro in business as they do to help him. The trouble is that they do not think for themselves. If the highly educated Negro would forget most of the untried theories taught him in school, if he could see through the propaganda which has been instilled into his mind under the pretext of education, if he would fall in love with his own people and begin to sacrifice for their uplift, if the highly educated Negro would do these things, he could solve some of the problems now confronting the race. During recent years we have heard much of education and business administration departments in Negro colleges. But if they be judged by the products turned out by these departments, they are not worth a continental. The teachers in this field are not prepared to do the work, and the trustees of our institutions are spending their time with trifles instead of addressing themselves to the study of a situation which threatens the Negro with economic extermination. Recently, the author saw the need for a change of attitude when a young woman came almost directly to his office after her graduation from a business school to seek employment. After hearing her story, he finally told her that he would give her a trial at $15 a week. $15 a week, she cried. I cannot live on that, sir. 
I do not see why you cannot, he replied. You have lived for some time already, and you say that you have never had permanent employment, and you have none at all now. But a woman has to dress and to pay board, said she, and how can she do it on such a pittance? The amount offered was small, but it was a great deal more than she is worth at present. In fact, during the first six or nine months of her connection with some enterprise, it will be of more service to her than she will be to the firm. Coming out of school without experience, she will be a drag on a business until she learns to discharge some definite function in it. Instead of requiring the firm to pay her, she should pay it for training her. Negro business today then finds the miseducated employees its heaviest burden. Thousands of graduates of white business schools spend years in establishments in undergoing apprenticeship without pay and rejoice to have the opportunity thus to learn how to do things. The schools in which Negroes are now being trained, however, do not give our young people this point of view. They may occasionally learn the elements of stenography and accounting, but they do not learn how to apply what they have studied. The training which they undergo gives a false conception of life when they believe that the business world owes them a position of leadership. They have the idea of business training that we used to have of teaching when it was thought that we could teach anything we have studied. Graduates of our business schools lack the courage to throw themselves upon their resources and work for a commission. The large majority of them want to be sure of receiving a certain amount at the end of the week or month. They do not seem to realize that the great strides in business have been made by paying men according to what they do. Persons with such false impressions of life are not good representatives of schools of business administration. Not long ago, a firm of Washington, D.C. appealed to the graduates of several of our colleges and offered them an inviting proposition on the commission basis, but only five of the hundreds appealed to responded and only two of the five gave satisfaction. Another would have succeeded but he was not honest in handling money because he had learned to purloin the treasury of the athletic organization while in college. All of the others, however, were anxious to serve somewhere in an office for a small wage a week. Recently, one of the large insurance companies selected for special training in this line 15 college graduates of our accredited institutions and financed their special training in insurance. Only one of the number, however, rendered efficient service in this field. They all abandoned the effort after a few days' trial and accepted work in hotels and with the Pullman Company, or they went into teaching or something else with a fixed stipend until they could enter upon the practice of professions. The thought of the immediate reward, short-sightedness, and the lack of vision and courage to struggle and win the fight made them failures to begin with. They are unwilling to throw aside their coats and collars and do the groundwork of Negro business and thus make opportunities for themselves instead of begging others for a chance. The educated Negro from the point of view of commerce and industry then shows no mental power to understand the situation which he finds. He has apparently read his race out of that sphere, and with the exception of what the illiterate Negroes can do blindly, the field is left wide open for foreign exploitation. Foreigners see this opportunity as soon as they reach our shores and begin to manufacture and sell to Negroes, especially such things as caps, neckties, and house dresses, which may be produced at a small cost and under ordinary circumstances. The main problem with the Negro in this field, however, is salesmanship. That is where he is weak. It is unfortunate, too, 
that the educated Negro does not understand or is unwilling to start small enterprises which make the larger ones possible. If he cannot proceed according to the methods of the gigantic corporations about which he reads in books, he does not know how to take hold of things and organize the communities of the poor along lines of small businesses. Such training is necessary, for the large majority of Negroes conducting enterprises have not learned business methods and do not understand the possibilities of the field in which they operate. Most of them in the beginning had no experience and started out with such knowledge as they could acquire by observing someone's business from the outside. One of them, for example, had waited on a white businessmen's club and passing the members a box of cigars or bringing a pitcher of water. When they began to discuss business, however, he had to leave the room. About the only time he could see them in action was when they were at play, indulging in extravagances which the Negro learned to take up before he could afford them. Negro businesses, thus handicapped, therefore have not developed stability and the capacity for growth. Practically all worthwhile Negro businesses which were flourishing in 1900 are not existing today. How did this happen? Well, Negro businessmen have too much to do. They have not time to read the business literature and study the market upon which they depend, and they may not be sufficiently trained to do these things. They are usually operating in the dark or by the hit or miss method. They cannot secure intelligent guidance because the schools are not turning out men properly trained to take up Negro business as it is to develop and make it what it ought to be rather than find fault with it. Too often, when the founder dies, then the business dies with him, or it goes to pieces soon after he passes away, for nobody has come into sufficiently close contact with him to learn the secret of his success in spite of his handicaps. The business among Negroes, too, continues individualistic in spite of advice to the contrary. The founder does not take kindly to the cooperative plan and such business education as we now give the youth does not make their suggestions to this effect convincing. If the founder happens to be unusually successful too, the business may outgrow his knowledge and becoming too unwieldy in his hands may go to pieces by errors of judgment or because of mismanagement it may go into the hands of whites who are usually called in at the last hour to do what they call refinancing but what really means the actual taking over of the business from the Negroes. The Negroes then finally withdraw their patronage because they realize that it is no longer an enterprise of the race and the chapter is closed. All of the failures of the Negro business, however, are not due to troubles from without. Often the Negro businessman lacks common sense. The Negro in business, for example, too easily becomes a social quote-unquote lion. He sometimes plunges into the leadership in local matters. He becomes popular in restricted circles, and men of less magnetism grow jealous of his inroads. He learns how richer men of other races waste money. He builds a finer home than anybody else in the community. And in his social program, he does not provide for much contact with the very people upon whom he must depend for patronage. He has the finest car, the most expensive dress, the best summer home, and so far out distances his competitors in society that they often set to work in childlike fashion to bring him down 